All right, welcome to lecture four, Tests of Significance and Inference for Distributions. So as lecture three finished up, we were talking about how what we learned about the sampling distribution of sample means, or we just call it the sampling distribution, um, how if our sample lives somewhere in that distribution, we know that the true population parameter with some degree of probability will lie within one, two, or three standard deviations of our sample mean. And so we said knowing that these two are going to be close to each other and knowing properties about the normal distribution allow us to make inferences around a confidence interval. So we can have some degree of confidence that from our sample estimate, the true population parameter lies within um, some interval that is bounded around that sample mean. Um, so today we're going to talk about the other way that we can use inference, which is with tests of significance. Um, and uh, this will be something, a process that we go through. I'm going to kind of introduce a process today that we're going to go through for each one of the statistical tests um, that we'll use in this um, course. So today is a really important lecture. Um, good luck. So as I just mentioned, um, if our goal is to find uh, or to estimate a population parameter, so for example, the mean in a population, uh, confidence intervals are a good way to do that. Um, tests of significance are used to assess the evidence provided by the sample data in favor of some claim about the population parameters. So we'll talk about those claims. So regardless of the test statistic, we're going to go through this same process each time. And this is the process, all right? First, you are going to state a null hypothesis, and we represent that with an H and a subscript zero, or a null, and an alternative uh, hypothesis, which can be, in some books, H1. I'm going to use here H sub A, the A representing alternative. Uh, the test is designed to test the strength of the evidence against the null. So HA is the statement that we'll, we will accept if the evidence enables us to reject the null hypothesis, okay? So we form our null and our alternative hypothesis. We state those. Then we calculate the value of a test statistic on which this um, hypothesis evaluation will be tested and based. So this statistic usually measures how far the data are from the null. Then we find the p-value of the observed data, and we state a conclusion. So are we going to accept or reject the null hypothesis? In general, we don't use accept. We say, are we going to reject or do we fail to reject the null hypothesis? Depending on the size of the p-value and our significance level or the level of risk that we're willing to, to take on to falsely reject a true null hypothesis. And this is called type one error. And we'll talk about that later, but I'm just kind of introducing this process now. We're gonna go through it and then I'll bring it back in at the, uh, towards the end. Okay, so the first step in our process is to state the null hypothesis, H sub zero, and the alternative hypothesis, which is H sub A. All right, when I think of a definition for hypothesis, I always go back to seventh grade science class where my teacher taught me that a hypothesis was an educated guess. So we'll develop that a little more, but we'll stick with it for now. Um, the role of a hypothesis is to reflect a problem statement or a research question. That is, it helps you translate your research questions into a, something, into a form that can be tested, particularly with a statistical test. So let's, for example, say we have this research question, what is the relationship between students' socioeconomic status and their school's school grade? Uh, so in North Carolina, we have an A through F grading system. You may have seen it as you look at schools. They all report their letter grade uh, publicly as part of their accountability system. And we might want to know, well, what's the relationship between the student's um, affluence or poverty within that school setting, their socioeconomic status, and their grade. And so the question is, and take a minute, what might pot, what hypothesis might grow out of this question? So having done that, I'm going to go ahead and write it. So the hypothesis that I would write 
would be, um, my hypothesis might be there is a positive relationship between SES, students SES, and school grades, period, okay? So I took the question here, what's the relationship, and I posited, uh, I created some hypothesis from that, okay? And I said there's a positive relationship between SES and school grades, and I, I apologize for my handwriting. It's bad more generally, but it's particularly bad. All right, so fleshing out the educated guess a little bit more, uh, there's some properties of good hypotheses. They need to be declarative statements. Uh, they need to be brief. They need to posit a relationship between two variables or differences among groups. Um, they should, of course, be rooted in the literature, reflect some body of scholarly literature or some theory of action. So they seem to resonate with those who read it, especially experts in the field. Um, and then, of course, the most important property is they need to be testable. Okay, so here are two examples of statements, and these are kind of value-laden statements that you may hear expressed. So in the K-12 settings, um, charter schools are a big issue, so you may have somebody express the following. Charter schools should replace public schools in our poor communities. Now, this is a value judgment, but we're scientists, we're researchers, we want to figure out how this might be testable. So take a moment and think of how you might rewrite this statement to make it a testable hypothesis. All right, and then, and then once you finish that one, do the second one, and then I'll talk through how I would reason through some of these. But the second one is, very few parents attended our parent-teacher night. So most parents in our school must not care about their children's education. So you hear this a lot, particularly with certain socioeconomic groups. The parents aren't here, they must not care. Again, that's an opinion. And so we want to know, well, what research or what testable hypothesis can I create from that statement? So go ahead and work on both of those. Pause the video. All right. Now you've unpaused, right? You've thought through it. So the first one, let's say, for example, there's this assumption underlying it that in poor communities, uh, charter schools are better, right? So you could create some hypothesis around that. And the hypothesis may be that poor communities will be more likely to have higher attendance in charter schools than more affluent communities, okay? So that's something that's testable. And you could disagree with that, but it's something I could test, you know? It's a hypothesis, and it's saying I could look at poor communities, I could look at more affluent communities, I could look at their rates of enrollment or how many charters are there, and I could test whether or not there's a difference between those two. All right, the second one about parent-teacher night has a lot of underlying assumptions as well. So maybe we pick... Uh, a context. So let's say that I work in rural settings. And so I say, within a rural context, parents who work outside the county will be less likely to attend parent teacher night than those who attend, who work, uh, excuse me, who work inside the county, right? So maybe this is a distance issue. And I think that, you know, I'm in this rural context, some parents are commuting, um, and they're having to come in and they're not going to be able to make it because our parent night starts at five o'clock or something like that. Okay, so there are lots of testable questions. You could have gone lots of directions. I was just giving you one where you have to get specific, has to be testable, and it's nice to root it in a particular context. Okay, so part of hypotheses testing, we, we've just been talking about some uh, directional hypotheses that we created, or at least some hypothe testable hypotheses that we created from either statements or from research questions. Um, now we want to break that down a little bit more and be a little more concrete and specific. So the null hypothesis is the statement that's going to be tested in our test of significance. Okay, we always test against the null. And the null hypothesis is generally a statement of no effect or no difference or no relationship. Okay, it depends on what you're studying in terms of the research, but the idea is that there is no difference between these groups. So there is no relationship between these variables. So for example, here we have, there is no difference between two means in the population. So maybe between charter schools, to use our last example, 
and traditional public schools, that there's no difference in student performance between those two. And it always refers to population parameters. So that's why we use Greek letters here for mu sub one uh, and mu sub two. So the idea would be that we test against this idea that the mean and the population for uh, charter school performance, students that are in charter schools and those in traditional public settings, that there's no difference between those two groups, again, in the population. And so that's why we use uh, mu sub one is equal to mu sub two. Now, the alternative hypothesis expresses the effect or the relationship for which we hope to find some evidence, okay? Uh, this is often as expressed as a statement that there is a relationship between two variables, or there is a difference between two groups, or there is an effect of the intervention that I just implemented, um, or the training program that I just ran through, right? Um, and so there's two types of these. There's directional alternative hypotheses, and there's non-directional, so we'll talk about both in turn. Okay, so let's start with directional alternative hypotheses. These are hypotheses that reflect a difference in the population parameter, and then the direction of that difference or that relationship is specified. And in that case, when we go to the testing part, we're going to have to use a one-sided hypothesis test. So we'll, we'll get to that later. But the idea is that there's some directionality. Um, so for example, there is a difference in the two mean in the population and that mu sub one will be greater than mu sub two. So I'm positing some direction. If you think back to our SES and school grades example, the idea would be that I express my alternative hypothesis as there is a positive relationship between SES and school grades, or there is a negative relationship between SES and school grades if you were positing the other side. Now again, good hypotheses are formed by, informed by the research literature. So knowing what we know about student poverty and its effects on achievement, this is the most likely direction that we would posit, right? That there is a positive difference or positive relationship, excuse me, between socioeconomic status and school grades. And so that's expressed there with H sub A, mu sub one, and the population is greater than mu sub two. Now, as the name implies, a non-directional alternative hypothesis does not specify the direction of the difference or of the relationship, right? So there is a difference in the two means in the population, okay? Or there is some type of relationship between these two variables, uh, but it's not specified. So mu sub one is not equal to mu sub two. So we would just say more generally, there is a relationship between SES and school grades. I'm not saying whether it'll be positive or ne negative. I'm just gonna test the fact, test to see if it is different at all, right? Uh, so that's how a non-directional alternative hypothesis works. All right, so here's a quick exercise I want you to do. I'm gonna, of course, go through it, but pause it now, work on this. What you wanna do is identify, is this a null hypothesis? Is this an alternative hypothesis? If it is alternative, is it directional or is it non-directional, okay? So you'll identify each one of those through these one through five and uh, pause it now and then I'm gonna go through it. All right, so. Let's do this first one. There is a negative relationship between income and eligibility for the after-school tutoring program. So of course this one, when I get negative relationship, it tells me there's some sense of directionality. So I know this will be an alternative hypothesis. I'll just do H sub A, and then it's gonna be directional. Okay. Number two, there is no relationship between teacher bonuses and student achievement. Well, anytime we get no relationship or no difference, we should be thinking, ah, that's gonna be the null. That's what we're gonna test against. That in the population, there's no difference or there is no relationship. Okay, for number three, we hypothesize that greater exposure to the math core, to math core will be associated with larger gains in students' phonemic awareness. So this one, again, we have an alternative hypothesis and it's gonna be directional. 
Now, the difference between this first one is this was directional in the negative sense, and this one's directional in the positive sense. So larger gains, greater exposure equals larger gains versus uh, the negative relationship in number one. All right, number four, thus, we believe that there will be a, there will be a relationship between teacher use experience and use of the new data system, okay? So they're coming to some conclusion here, but notice that they just say there will be a relationship, and they don't posit how that relationship might be. Is it positive? Is it negative? Is it going to be better or worse? We don't know. So the idea would be, well, this is positing some uh, alternative hypothesis, but this would be non-directional, right? They're not positing in direction. And then finally, number five, where teachers were trained has no influence on how great they will be in the classroom. Well, when I get no influence or no relationship, that makes me think that this would be the null hypothesis. Okay, so you're testing against something with null. So that's kind of how we pick out uh, whether or not it's a null or an alternative, and whether or not that alternative is directional or non-directional. Okay, so in this process we're going to go through, number one was to state the null and alternative hypothesis, and number two now is to calculate the value of the test statistic upon which this hypothesis test will be based. Okay, so the test statistic will be determined by the situation. That's what we talked about at the beginning, is to know which statistical test do I go to? Well, your hypotheses are going to point you in the right direction. So if we are null and alternative hypothesis, talk about comparing means, then we'll go ahead and use a one or two sample t-test or an ANOVA. Um, we can also use a regression. Um, if we're going to examine relationships and the variables are categorical, we can use a chi-square test. If they're more continuous or quantitative measures, we can use a correlation. And then, of course, we can use a regression uh, in actually both of these instances. Um, that test statistic will be based on the parameters that appear in our hypotheses. So if we're testing against two means, then we will calculate sample means from the sample that we have to compare. All right, and finally, if the values of our estimate are far from the parameter value specified in our null hypothesis, which is usually zero, no difference or no relationship, then that gives evidence against the null. And remember, that's what we test against, okay? And that'll become more clear. This last point will become more clear as we move through some examples. Okay, so I want to use an extended example with the one sample Z test. So that's the test statistic that we'll uh, use this example for the second part on. So from the first day of class, if you remember, we talked about these best selling books. And if we wanted to compare the 12 books that we selected out from the population of best sellers, and we wanted to know is there some meaningful difference in the average number of books sold or the mean number of books sold? for R12 versus the entire population of bestsellers, then we would use the one sample Z test. So I'll have one from education with the SAT example, but I just want you to have that picture in mind. Okay, so let's go back to the SAT exam example we used um, previously in one of our lectures. Okay, so if you remember, uh, the SAT, we have a random sample of 500 high school students who take the SAT, and let's say they all come from one school district in California, and the mean score for these students was 461. So since this is the sample, we're going to use X bar, and then I put SAT as the subscript just to say this is their score on the SAT was 461. Well, let's say that we know that the true SAT score for all California high school seniors is 450 with a standard deviation of 100, okay? So the question for us is, are the students from this school district performing differently than all teachers in the state? So we're comparing the sample that we have, where they scored a 461. Are they different than the sample of all California seniors, which scored 450, or the full population? 
okay, this is the this is the same slide. I just have a parenthetical here I wanted to add. So in other words, can we attribute this 11 point difference to chance alone? All right. Or is there something systematic about the seniors in this district, maybe the instruction that's going on, maybe the types of students that are here uh, that leads to a higher average SAT score? So that's the difference we're really testing against, right? Is this 11 point difference from 460 and four, to 461 to 450, is that meaningful or is it just due to random chance? Okay, so this is its own slide, but go ahead, take a minute. As we discussed, we first start always with stating the null and the alternative hypothesis. So go ahead and write those out now. Okay, so here is what I wrote here on the slide. So the, the null hypothesis, H sub zero, is that there is no difference in SAT scores between the district seniors and the state seniors, right? And so there's two ways to write this. You could write that mu, and then I put the subscript of district SAT just to label it. So mu sub district is equal to mu sub state for the SAT. The other way to say this, because we know the state is 450, we could just pause the number and say that the mu of the district SAT score is equal to 450. Okay, so in the population, that's what the true estimate is. Now, we know our sample is 461, right? But here we're stating the null hypothesis of there's no difference, so we could just say mu sub district SAT equals 450. So the alternative, and let's make it non-directional, let's just say there is a difference in SAT scores between the district seniors and the state seniors, okay? Now, in our sample, it's a little higher, but let's say before we even knew that, we're asking the research questions, we might not pause the direction. We might just say, these students seem different, and they could be better or worse. We don't know. We're not going to pause at that. So we'll say mu sub district SAT is not equal to the mu sub state SAT, or the mu sub district SAT is not equal to 450. Okay, here is our first formula for our test statistic, the one sample Z statistic. We take our estimate, we subtract our hypothesized value, and we divide that by the standard deviation of the estimate. So in letter form, Z equals X bar, our estimated mean, minus mu, the population mean, over the standard deviation of the estimate. And that is defined by sigma, the population standard deviation, over the square root of n, or over the square root of the sample size. All right, I included a slide here just filling in the numbers. So we know that our estimate, the mean for the district, was 461. The hypothesized value was 450, or in this case, we know the population mean over the standard deviation of that estimate, which is uh, 100, the standard deviation for the population, over the square root of the sample size, or 500, which is 22.4. Uh, so if you do the math on the next slide, we'll talk through it. All right, and if you run that math through, you should get a Z statistic, calculated Z statistic of 0.49. And that's expressed here in standard deviation units. So an average difference of 11 points between our district and the true population mean of California SAT seniors uh, translates to about 0.49 standard deviation units. Okay, So we stop there for now. We've stated our null and alternative, and now we have our calculated our test statistic. Okay, here is one more example that I want to run through together uh, before we leave this. So we have um, an opportunity to calculate the one sample Z statistic again. So go ahead and go through this, and then I'll, I'll go through it as well. All right, so 
we have here, uh, how likely is it that we would obtain a sample mean X bar of 202.94 from a population mean mu of 193.8 and a population standard deviation of 31.55 if the sample size is 50? So it looks like we have everything we need to calculate uh, the one sample Z test statistic. But before we do that, we want to state our null and all alternative hypothesis. So remember, we're going to use the Greek lettering. So we'll say mu uh, from our sample is, uh, but the population parameter uh, is equal to 193.80, or that null hypothesis value. And the alternative mu would be that it is not equal to 193.8. Okay, so we're testing against that number, and we're going to see if what we gathered in our sample X bar uh, is different than that. Okay, so to calculate the Z statistic, remember we're going to do um, our sample mean 2.94, subtract our population mean 193.80 over the standard deviation of the population 3.55 over the square root of the sample size, okay? And so what I would do would be to break down each one of these. So I would subtract this first. I would find that product next, uh, this difference here on the, um, in the, numerator, on the denominator, uh, and then I would do the final division. And if you do all that, you get roughly uh, 205 as the Z statistic, and that'll be expressed in standard deviation units. Okay, so we've stated our null and all alternative hypothesis. Step one, step two was we calculated a test statistic and the example we used was the one sample Z statistic. Uh, now the third step we're gonna go through is we find the P value. The U.S. Supreme Court considers plus or minus two to three standard deviation units as its criterion for rejecting a null hypothesis. Uh, because not all test statistics are normally distributed, we translate uh, these standard deviation units into a p-value or the language of probability. Okay, So a p-value says the following. Assuming the null hypothesis is true, the p-value is the probability that we would observe a test statistic as extreme as ours, so as extreme or more extreme than ours, uh, than the one that's actually observed, and I say than ours, than the one we calculated. Thus, the smaller the p-value, so as p gets smaller, as that probability gets smaller, the greater evidence there's provided against the null of hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis, okay? So just to say it again, the, the p-value is the probability that we would observe a result as extreme as our test statistic uh, due to chance alone, or assuming that the null hypothesis is true. So I mentioned this right at the end of the last slide, um, but another way to think about this is that the p-value is the probability that we would observe a value as extreme as ours due to chance alone, okay? So if the U.S. Supreme Court considers a, a you know, a standard deviation unit of plus and minus two and three standard deviations, we can use our z-table for the one sample z statistic and see, well, what p-values correspond to these z statistics? Uh, on the next slide, I'll go through that. But go ahead and get out your z-table and see if you can find those values. So if you remember how we use our Z table, we go ahead and we look for our Z values. So we can look at positive two, uh, if you'd like to look at that, or if your table starts with negative numbers, start with negative two, uh, and then do 2.0 and go into the body of that, into the, the metrics that fill out that table, and you'll get 0.997, or excuse me, 0.9772, okay? If we take one minus that, we get 
or 0.05 for a two-tail significance test. Okay, we double it if we're going to do on both sides. Okay, and we we I know I keep alluding to this. We're going to get to it, but the idea is if you have a directional test, you use a one-tailed hypothesis test. If it's non-directional, you'll have two uh, two-tailed uh, hypothesis test. So that was the value for two as a 0.05 value. So anything less than 0.05 or smaller than that p-value the Supreme Court would say, well, that's more beyond two standard deviation units, and we'll accept that as evidence against the null. Uh, and then they said, we'll go all the way up to three. So if you look at three, 3.0 or negative 3.0, you'll get the 0.9990 or 0.001, and you can double that for a two-tailed test and get 0.002. Um, but those would be uh, the p-values that the Supreme Court would be looking for, anything more extreme than those. All right, this is a visual representation of those two standard deviations. So notice we have our normal distribution again. You can see one standard deviation units, but now we're two, beyond two, and we're saying that the probability that our Z statistic will lie outside that is 0.0228 on the positive side and 0.0228 on the negative side. So the p-value is somewhere around 0.05. And then here's a visual representation for three standard deviation units away. So you could see if our Z statistic is beyond negative three or beyond positive three, that there's a very small P value associated with that. That is the probability that we would observe a Z statistic that extreme is quite small when, if it's due to chance alone. So I keep talking about the Supreme Court as kind of this reference, but of course in the social sciences, it's not necessarily we're beholden to the Supreme Court. That's one standard we could look to. But in general, in the social sciences, we accept a p-value that's less than or equal to 0.05 as evidence in favor of uh, rejecting or failing to reject the null hypothesis. All right, And that's kind of due to a variety of reasons, including historical ones. Okay, so if we go back now to our SAT example, remember we calculated a z-score of 0.49. So if we go ahead and using that z-score look at our z-table, we find that the probability that the, the value will be greater than 0.49 is 1 minus that value you find in that table, which is 0 0.6870, so 0 0.3121. But we're assuming a two-tailed hypothesis test. So go to the next slide. Since we posited a two-tailed hypothesis test, that would be that there is no difference or that the sample hypothesis, the sample mean was no different than the population mean. Then we also need to have a values extreme as negative 0.49 in that direction. So you could see in both of these shaded regions. So our p-value is 2 times 0.3121 or 0.6242. That is, there's a 62.42% chance that we would observe as a value as extreme as z equals 0.49 if the null hypothesis was true. Uh, that's quite a large chance, right? Quite a high probability. Okay, so now I want to go back to the second example that we had where we calculated a Z statistic of roughly 2.05. So pause it now, go back into your Z table and find what they calculate the p-value. Now remember, before you get that answer, remember we have a two-tailed test. So whatever value you find, you'll want to double that to get the p-value since we're on both uh, extremes. Okay, so hopefully you've calculated that. Now we can estimate this roughly, right? We know that a Z value of around two is about 0.05, that's the probability. So we know we're gonna be a little bit less than that, but we can go ahead and look it up in our Z table. And in the Z table I'm looking at, when I look at 0.02.05, 
I get a value of 0.97982. Uh, okay. But we want the p value of that. So we're going to do 1 minus that value. Okay. So 1 minus 0.97982 equals. 0.02018, and then we can double that and get a p-value of 0.04, roughly. Okay? So that is our p-value. And so if we're to translate what that means, remember what that means is that we would observe a z-statistic of 2.05 uh, due to chance alone, at a rate of about 0.04, the probability that we would observe a test statistic as extreme as 2.05 is 0.04. There's about a 4% chance that that would be due to chance alone, okay? If we translate that back to what we have, observing a sample mean of 202.94, when the true population parameter is 193.80, that we would observe that extreme difference if there was no difference at a rate of about, uh, at the probability of 0.04. All right, so now we've done three things. We've stated our null and all alternative hypothesis. We've calculated a test statistic, and we found a p-value. So the final step that we'll go through is to state a conclusion. Okay, so let's go back to our SAT example. Sorry we keep switching back and forth examples, but back to SAT. Remember, we calculated a p-value of 0.6242. That is, we would observe a Z statistic as extreme as ours uh, at a probability of 0.6242. That is due to chance alone, okay? So what does that mean with respect to the sampling distribution of sample means that our sample lives in within? Well, for every 100 times I replicate this process of grabbing 500 students from a district, we would observe a, a, a mean as extreme as ours about 62 times out of 100 due to chance alone, okay? So what does that mean in the context of statistical significance? Okay, so we have something related to statistical significance that we call the critical value, okay? We set this, this is a predetermined value that we have set, which is the degree of risk that we're willing to take to reject a null hypothesis when it is in fact true, okay? It's kind of like the risk we're willing to, uh, to take here. Um, so with respect to every hypothesis that we test, there are four possible outcomes. So this is a great two by two table, just as an example here, to help you understand the difference between type one and type two error. Okay, so we have here on the rows, the x-axis here, the true nature of the null hypothesis. Well, the null hypothesis in the population is either true or it's false, okay? And then down the columns, we, can, we have the actions that we'll take. So we either uh, accept the null hypothesis, or another way to say that, it's a little confusing, is to fail to reject the null, okay? So we accept the null or we reject the null, okay? So if the null is true, so this is the cell number one, if the null is true and we accept the null hypothesis, then we're great. So we say that there is no difference and we accept that null and in the true population there is no difference, then we're good, okay? So there's no error there and there really is no difference or there's no relationship, okay? But what if the null hypothesis is true but we reject the null? That is, we reject a null hypothesis that is actually true. That's when we commit a type one error, okay? So we say that there is no, that there is a difference between the groups when in fact there really isn't. Or we say there is an effect or there is a relationship, but there isn't one in, in, in the population. That's a type one error, all right? A type two error is when in fact there is a difference or between groups, so there is a relationship, but we reject the null hypothesis. So that's quadrant number three down there. And that's called a type two error. And this often happens when we have a small sample size. Uh, a and then the fourth quadrant is good. That's when we reject the null. And in fact, in reality, we should have. Uh, the null was not true. 
uh, so that that column one or quadrants one and four are when we we hit truth. So now back to critical values. Critical values are those predetermined values associated with the degree of risk that we're willing to take to reject a null hypothesis when in fact it's actually true. So we say that there is a relationship or we say there is a group difference when in reality there isn't one. And remember that's called a type one error. So that critical value is what's our degree of risk for making a type one error? In general, in the social sciences, we use 0.05 and 0.01 as critical values. So for our Z table, we talked about this a little bit in the last lecture, but that's plus or minus 1.96 for 0.05 and plus or minus 2.58 for 0.01. So now we can go back to our SAT example again. So what's the probability of committing a type one error or falsely rejecting a new hypo null hypothesis when it's true? Um, that's our p-value we calculated was 0.6242. Now that's a lot greater than our critical value of 0.05, right? Or 0.01. So the idea is that's too risky. I'm not willing to say that there are differences when the probability of being wrong is 0.6242. Okay, so we would side with the null hypothesis and accept it, or as we also say, fail to reject the null hypothesis that these state district seniors, even though they scored higher at 461 compared to 450, that these differences uh, cannot be ruled out due to chance alone, that there is really no difference between this district and the state seniors. All right, now to revisit our other example that you calculated on your own, remember we calculated a p-value of 0.0404. And so what's our conclusion with a significance level of 0.05? Well, 0.0404 is smaller than 0.05. So given if that's our critical value, we can reject the null hypothesis and say that there is a difference in our sample compared to the population. But let's say that we wanted to be uh, more confident in our, um, and we weren't willing to accept a p-value of 0.05. In fact, our critical value was going to be 0.01. Then what would we conclude? Well, in this case, 0.04 is larger than 0.01. And so we would fail to reject the null hypothesis or we'd accept it. And we'd say, well, you know what? Given the critical value I set, there is no difference between the sample and this population mean. Okay, now with the SAT example and this last example we used, we tested a null hypothesis that was non-directional. Uh, that means it posited any difference was okay, positive or negative. Uh, but we learned above we could have directional hypotheses. So let's say our alternative hypothesis is, was that mu sub one was greater than mu sub two. Uh, if so, our critical value will change because now we're not looking at both sides. So you can see uh, in this graphic on the screen here, let me grab my pen. Um, you can see on this top one here, the two-tailed critical value for 0.05, a p-value of 0.05, um, is 1.96. That's what we talked about, right? So you would reject the null if you were in any of these regions here. But if we posited a positive, then it would be 0.05 to the right, anything 0.05 to the right of this. And the critical value changes to 1.6 five or four nine five okay and if it was negative then it's just the negative version of that negative oh i should make that clear negative 1.65 rounded okay so our critical value changes a little bit if you're testing a directional hypothesis <laughs> 
All right. In general, though, we use a two-tailed hypothesis test just to be conservative, either when we suspect a directional relationship, okay? So in general, we're always just going to test the two, two-tailed two test just to be a little more conservative uh, or to have those p-values uh, be a little more extreme uh, in, for us to reject a null hypothesis. Okay, now thinking about uh, your own work and thinking about the work that you're going to analyze as you read other papers in the field, um, it's really important to think about the difference between statistical significance and practical significance. So it's not enough for somebody to say that something is statistically significant. You need to think about the context itself, right? How big is the effect? Uh, what's the size um, what if that sample size is large? So I have data sets with millions of students in it, so I can get really precise estimates. So I can get very small estimates of essentially zero, right? It's a statistically significant effect of close to zero, right? And I can test that because I have, my sample size is so large. Um, so it's really up to us as authors, if we have research, to, to talk about this practical significance and to contextualize it. Or if we're consumers of the research to think about, well, what is the practical significance of this? All right, so here is a slide summarizing what we went through today, this process that we're going to go through. We always state our null and all alternative hypothesis. Remember, the null hypothesis will test no difference or no relationship or no effect. And the alternative hypothesis can be directional, but in general, we'll do non-directional null hypothesis that there is a relationship or there is some difference. We'll go ahead and calculate a test statistic, and the test statistic we calculate will be depend on the context as well. So in this case, we wanted to compare a sample of California seniors from a district to the state, the population, so we used one sample Z statistic. We then go ahead, one, having calculated that statistic, we find the p-value, and then we state a conclusion. All right, and our conclusion will depend on the critical value that we set or the degree of risk that we associate with making a type one error or falsely rejecting a true null hypothesis. Okay, and the last slide here is just some independent practice. I'm not going to go through this. We can go through this in class but it's just to get, get some drilling going uh, before you get to STATA and before STATA is going to make these calculations. It's nice to go through the process of doing this by hand. So remember to go through all four steps of the process for this. And in this case, I'm giving you uh, the one sample Z statistic that we'll use for both of these.